Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you both for coming. As you can tell from the questions here today, all of us, a lot of us have different concerns about how you meet the budget requirements placed upon you. Maybe we should be thinking about are these requirements too severe given the threats that we face and all the good programs are at risk. So, General Swartz, you're right. We can't have it both ways. We can't rearrange your budget for you, for you, send it back to you and your pr priorities and say, now go do all we want if we don't increase the money. So, but having said that, I think the Global Hawk and the U2 discussion is really a fascinating one for me. This is 2012, and we're talking about how a manned aircraft can do a better job than a drone through now in 2040. I just don't get that when it comes to this kind of mission. It doesn't make common sense to me. And what I'm worried about is what happened to the Global Hawk in terms of cost. I mean, it's gone up just exponentially over what was proposed. Is that because we keep changing the requirements or because of problems with the contractor? Senator Graham, uh, uh, two things. First of all, it's important to appreciate we're not getting out of the Global Hawk business. We're going to retain the Block 40 Global Hawk capability that's for ground moving target indicator as well as the communications platforms, the Block 20. So we're focused on the Block 30. A couple things. I think that, that reliability of the Global Hawk was an issue. Sub, subsystems in the Global Hawk uh, aircraft were problematic. The generators, for example, are a case in point, which, which the contractor has corrected, but it took time to do so, and, and uh, resources. I think that... In, did in they competit competitively bid for this program? They did. <clears throat> well, shouldn't we have a hearing one day, Mr. Chairman, about how a system competitively bid could be so overrun with cost and find out where the problem lies? Is it the Air Force changing their requirements, or is it the contractor not being able to fulfill as promised? You will recall, Senator, that, that the, 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 the original birth of this system was, was as a tech demonstrator. Right. And so it had a, an unusual birthing process, to be sure. Because we had a need, right? It, this was a technology effort that, that proved out, and, and we're going to make use of the Global Hawk capability. NATO will with, with the, the AGS. The Germans will with the Block 30 equivalent platform. Well, I guess what I'm saying is that we're shelving some of the, the Block 30 Global Hawks along the idea it doesn't work as well as the U-2. I just find that hard to believe. You know, I'm, I'm, the U-2 is a great platform and great air crews and maintainers, but I just can't believe it. A manned aircraft can do all the things that these drones are capable of doing for the next uh, 25 in, or 30 years. In the so. long run, Senator Graham, I would agree with you. Okay. Well, let's, let's just, see if we I'm can... I'm not dealing with the long no, run. No, no, I know. I know. But somebody needs to be. And uh, maybe that's what we're all up here for, is to try to find out the long run and not create budget crises that really make short-term decisions that are not long-term smart. So. I'd like to use the Global Hawk U2 debate as a case study and why programs cost more than they should, why they take longer, and where are we as a nation with a vision. I just envision more drones, less manned aircraft when it comes to surveillance because the cost of losing a pilot in a war is a lot different than it is losing a drone. So now let's move on to the Air Guard. <laughs> Uh, you've gotten a lot of questions about how we're going to uh, meet our budget goals on the personnel side. I guess the problem I have, like a lot of us up here, is that <clears throat> uh, on the Air Guard side, we're losing 5,100 people from the F fiscal year 12 enactment and 3,900 on the active duty size side. There's 328,900 active duty Airmen, there's 7,500 active duty, I mean, reservists in the Air Force Reserves, and 1,100 and 1,000, 101,600 Air National Guard. They get hit disproportionately harder than anybody else by a factor of three or four. Why is that? Uh, Sen Senator, we have. Uh, outline the, the process that we went through uh, based on changes in the strategy uh, and adjustments in force structure that came from that, uh, reductions in fighter force structure, reductions in 
mobility force structure. We then made uh, decisions about which platforms to take additional risk in, and then we uh, went from there to look at the active duty uh, uh, reserve component ratio in each of those platforms to make sure that we could so the basic premise sustain a ready force going You have less fighters. You ought to take them out of the air guard and put them in the active force. Is that the, the deal? The, the logic, Senator, has to do with the anticipated tempo in each of the components. What we did was we said we did not want to operate the active duty on a routine basis below a one to two deploy to dwell, six months deployed, one year home, and not less than one to four, ideally one to five for the guard and reserve given those are our, our management red lines. And, and we looked at the available force structure and the expected activity level and, and worked the mix in order not to cross those thresholds. Well, I guess my concern is that the lessons learned from the last 10 years is you can't go to war without the Guard and Reserve. You all know that. And it's not a, a, a slam on anybody. Our active Air Force is the best in the world by a factor of many, and the Guard and Reserve does have capability and experience. And this idea of using Guard units with, uh, with uh, active associates is a good idea, but only so far. I'm not trying to create a cheaper Air Force than the National Guard, Air Guard. I'm not trying to create more Air Guard wings where you have 80 associates from the Air Force making that Air Guard unit about one, two thirds cheaper to maintain, equally deployable. That's a good concept only so far. I just think what you're hearing from the committee here is that we're losing a lot of capability, and a part of our active, uh, a part of our military force is just cheaper to maintain. And these are pretty experienced folks, and they've gone to war, they've done a good job, and they get home, and a lot of their missions are going away. And that talent pool that we're losing, I think, has to be factored in there. So I hope you can work something out with the governors. My last, uh, and I would urge you to do that, uh, my last inquiry is about Iran. How large is the Iranian Air Force? It's a modest Air Force. I don't have specific numbers. I can give that to you for the record. When you rate Air Forces in the world, it is an older, more modest Air Force. Is that correct? How, how large is their Navy? I'm not an expert in that area, sir. Is it fair to say from the Air Force side, if you're asked to take the Iranian Air Force down, that is well within our capabilities? One-on-one, -on -one, there'll be no doubt about that. But it's not just airplane against airplane. This is, as you're very well aware, this is a more complex undertaking. They have rockets, they have missiles. They certainly do. But my question is about their Air Force. Their Air Force would not fly long and it would not f fly far. Do you agree with that in a fight with the United States? If that was the mission, that would be the outcome. Thank you. 